So Don, are you drilling pocket holes again? Well, I'm making some shop cabinets and I needed to drill some pocket holes for that using my Craig jig. My goodness, what are the woodworkers out there going to think about you? Now, I know some of you are going to say pocket holes. I don't use pocket holes. Well, pocket holes have been around for a very long time. They've been drilled in all kinds of ways. Okay, Don, now let's shed a little bit more light on the use of pocket holes in the past. In his blog, Woodworker's Edge, Glenn Huey wrote an entry he called Screw Gains, which is another name for pocket holes. This photo from that blog shows three methods for making pocket holes. The methods have changed over the years, haven't they? Shannon Rogers on his Renaissance Woodworkers YouTube channel showed another way of making pocket holes. In the video, Shannon creates a pocket hole using a brace and a combination gimlet bit. In the introduction to the video, Shannon states that cabinet makers and joiners were using pocket holes even 300 or more years ago. W. Patrick Edwards states in a blog, Today a pocket screw device is rather common among cabinet makers who use it to fasten face plates to kitchen cabinets, among other uses. It is actually a continuation of the method developed centuries ago for installing a screw on a 90 degree joint. The premise of his blog is that furniture can be dated by the type of joinery that was used and the evidence that was left over by the tools that were used by the woodworker. He states that using that information, he knows that this is a pocket hole that was done before 1850. For those of you who think pocket holes were not used in fine furniture, this is just a small sampling of great furniture builders that we know use pocket holes in their work. Based on when they made their furniture, we also know that the joint lasts a long time. The following is information on John and Thomas Seymour, two of these makers. This is an example of a federal mahogany inlaid table that we know is attributed to John and Thomas Seymour. And we also know that it had pocket hole joinery. The pocket holes in this piece are very consistent with those that are attributed to the Seymours. I've included here a black and white photo of the underside of a Seymour piece you can clearly see the pocket hole screws in this photo. This is a close-up of that same photo. You can see that pocket screws were used to attach the rails to the legs, and they were also used to attach the top to the rails. For those of you who think that pocket holes might devalue a piece, this is a piece of Seymour furniture that was sold at auction. It first appeared on the Antiques Roadshow. The lady photographed here bought it at a yard sale for $20. Her friend even tried to talk her out of buying it because she thought it was old and wobbly. While I can't say for sure that this piece had pocket screws, it sure looks like there possibly might be some in this photo, but the resolution is very poor. But if it's consistent with all the other tables that the Seymours made during this period, it most likely does have pocket holes. So what's a table like this worth? Well, here's the appraised value in 1997 from the Antiques Roadshow. After receiving that assessment, the lady decided to auction it off the next year. 
and this is what she got for the table. And at a 20% buyer's premium, the buyer paid an extra $98,000 to Sotheby's for this table. So I guess that furniture that has pocket holes in it doesn't lose its value. Now I have to admit that part of the value of this table was the fact that it still had its paper label from John and Thomas Seymour's shop. So that, I'm sure, added to the value. Here's another example of a Seymour table that earned its owner a considerable amount of money at auction in 2012. Admittedly, part of the value of this table has to do with an extensive history that we know about it. Also, the hand painting done by John Penniman is in excellent condition. Even Seymour pieces that don't have paper labels or an extensive history behind them can still sell for a considerable amount of money. This is a good example. Now, for those of you who believe that the pocket holes used in these pieces were always left unseen and that the buyer could never see them, take a look at the back of this sideboard. Yes, that's obviously four pocket holes that attach the back to the top of the sideboard. And in case you're wondering, here's what it sold for in 2019. Well, thank you, Don, for that time warp on pocket screw history and the background of pocket screws. I'm hoping now that our viewers may understand them a little bit better than they have in the past. I think I need to start going to yard sales, though. <laughs> that lady made a bundle on that piece of Seymour furniture. I'd love to be able to find something like that. I could really fund my woodworking. Well, that's a little bit of the history. Well, what's going on now with pocket screws? There are a lot of opinions out there. I found some blogs by Chris Schwartz, who's a very highly respected woodworker these days, and some others, plus a lot of comments about pocket screws that I thought I'd include here. So see if you like this. The first time Chris became aware of pocket screws was when he was in a grisly showroom handing out free magazines. There was a long line of perhaps 200 people waiting to be checked out. More than half of them were holding blue boxes. Eventually, Chris asked a customer what was the deal with the blue boxes. He replied, it's a Craig jig and now I can throw away my biscuit joiner. And now, quoting Chris, pocket screws took over the world for a while. And now, the woodworking world has been separated into those who swear by them and those who swear about them.
getting back to quoting Chris, I'm actually in neither camp. I love my Craig jig, but I don't use it for building cabinets or doors. Whenever I have something odd to clamp, think compound miters or weird corner cabinets, I reach for my Craig jig. With the help of the cheapest Craig jig, the Craig Mini, I can put a pocket almost anywhere. Then I drive a screw in and I can get plenty of clamping pressure right where I need it. And that's when we come to chairs. Most chair makers would laugh if I told them I use my Craig jig while building stick chairs, but I do. When joining the parts of an arm bow, I have to join curved parts at a really weird angle. The Craig jig makes it easy. Chris went on to another blog about pocket screws. I don't have enough elitism in my bloodstream to poop on pocket screws too much. For starters, they are incredibly ingenious and allow people to build things with only a handful of tools and almost no clamps. And they have been around for a long time. I've seen pocket screws in many pieces of 19th century furniture, including shaker stuff. But when the joinery is exposed, it's quite ugly, and so I avoid using them for what they were intended to do, make boxes and face frames. Instead, I use them as clamps, and at clamping, pocket screws have few equals. Sometimes I'll use them to help fix splits in thick slabs, especially when I can place them where they cannot be seen. P.S. And before you chap my hide with comments about pocket screws, they have been around a lot longer than your great-great-grandpa. Chris Schwartz mentioned that Shaker Furniture had pocket screws. This is a part of a blog by Will Myers on the subject. I just completed a pair of side tables copied from one I measured at Hancock Shaker Village last year. The top of the original table, dating to around 1840, was attached with pocket screws. The first thing that comes to mind when the words pocket screws are thought of is the modern Craig jig. Pocket screws are actually quite old. They existed long before Craig Summerfield came up with an apparatus to bore them in 1986. The early pocket screws are chopped out with a gouge. The majority of the old ones I've measured look pretty much the same. A gouge mark at the bottom and a coarsely chopped pocket. Here are some examples of the ones that he measured. These are quite easy and fast to cut. About the only special tool needed is an inconel gouge. No need to be particularly neat either. The old ones aren't. They are also nice because there's no other hardware needed besides screws. Using the information from his research, Will chopped pocket holes and screwed the top on the side tables. To find out more about Will's process, check out his blog on Lost Art Press. The link is in the description. Well, I have to agree with Christopher Schwartz. I'm in neither camp. Yes, I've used some pocket screws on my cabinet, but have I used them in fine furniture? Not yet, not really. I haven't found the need for them. I've used some mortise and tenon joinery and some other kinds of joinery that most of us would think of more traditional. And uh, I may use some pocket screws in the future. I don't know, especially things like attaching tops to a period piece. As I was working on this video, I looked around our house to see if I could find any of our furniture pieces that contained pocket holes. This is our dining table. It's made from solid cherry. Pam saw it in a store and loved it, so we decided to order one. The beauty of this table was part of my inspiration to get back into woodworking. The table currently has two of the four leaves in it. 
you'll notice that the design includes rails under the tabletop. Those rails are attached to the top of the table and the leaves with pocket screws. Located next to the table is my first project after getting back into woodworking. This is a solid sherry shaker style table. It was the beauty of the dining table that inspired me to get back into woodworking. That and the fact that the dining table replaced a dining table that I had made back when we bought our first home. So it's appropriate that they sit side by side in our dining room. In case you're wondering, this table doesn't have any pocket screws. I use mortise and tenon joinery. Some of you may recall the chest that I stood in front of when I tried out my new shoehorn that I turned the handle for. That's a wonderful chest. It was made by the Amish, but it does have some pocket holes. In fact, I even found some. This is what the chest looks like. It's made from solid quarter sawn white oak and it's very heavy and extremely sturdy. The face frame on this chest was attached with pocket screws. They can be seen when the cabinet door is open. These are both excellent pieces of furniture and having pocket holes does not deter from their value or their beauty. Most people wouldn't care that they contain pocket holes, nor would they even know what they were. I certainly don't care. I hope you found this video educational, at least that's how it was intended, to give you some information that a lot of people don't have about pocket holes and pocket screws. I did quite a bit of research on the topic, and yes, I looked into a lot of books and other things other than just the internet on the subject of pocket holes and pocket screws. One of the books that I looked at was this book that I bought in 1972 by Charles H. Hayward. Back when it was published in 1971, a cabinet maker was considered a master at building furniture, not making kitchen cabinets. Charles H. Hayward is considered by many to be one of the most important workshop writers and editors of the 20th century. He was a trained cabinet maker, extraordinary illustrator, photographer, and excellent designer. Hayward was the editor of the Woodworker magazine from 1939 to 1967. This was a time when our craft was transforming from one that was entirely hand tool based to one where machines were common. Machines became inexpensive, thus they displaced the hand planes, chisels, and back saws of Hayward's training and his youth. This is a diagram from page 85 in his book. Hayward states, when a tabletop of solid wood is attached to a piece, the front is attached with pocket screws to maintain overhang at the front of the piece. At the side and back, buttons which fit into grooves are used. This allows for shrinkage. According to the book, this is the way that Hayward addressed wood movement. The Taunton Press that publishes Fine Woodworking Magazine has a couple of books that I could recommend that mention pocket holes. The first is The Complete Illustrated Guide to Joinery by Gary Rogowski. The second one is Pocket Hole Joinery by Mark Edmondson. So I'd like to know your opinion on pocket holes and pocket screws, or using a pocket hole jig to make furniture. If you like this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up down below. Thank you all to those who have subscribed to our channel. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you've subscribed, 
ring that notification bell. That way you know when I'm going to be putting out videos. I have quite a few planned coming up, so you need to ring that bell so you know when they show up. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. I love reading the questions and comments and I like responding to them. Please share this video with others. If you have some other woodworkers that you know, please share our channel. Our channel's growing a little bit and that's really good, but it'd be nice if it could grow even more. So thank you all very much for watching.